Today, we are privileged to have our friend and colleague. Corey, I hope I can call you a friend by now. I think- yeah, We're friends. This is, it's old news. We're, we're buddies. We're homies. We're friends. We got it. We're together. I agree with that. Um, so Corey Sterling is from Conscious Council, of course, and he's here to talk today um, with us about how the yoga industry has changed in the post-COVID landscape. Um, today, we're going to talk about Studio Reopening 101, you know, which will entail what legal documents and legal considerations have to be updated. Uh, we're going to talk about a properly drafted waiver of liability, what to include in it. Um, and by the way, hint, most insurance companies do not, do not cover COVID or specifically, as, as our you know, policy um, states, um, does, doesn't cover the transmission of communicable diseases. That's pretty standard for yoga for insurance policies. Um, we're going to talk about revisiting employee agreements. And there's you know, the difference in an employee versus a contractor, how to communicate effectively with your team. We're going to talk about practicing online and going virtual, how to protect yourself. And that's your social media, website disclaimer, your privacy policy. And then we'll talk about practicing proactive law, how to prepare if a staff member or client gets COVID. Um, so let me introduce myself real quick. I'm Joe Fagan. I'm the director of strategic partnerships for Biogi. Um, here at Biogi, of course, we offer membership programs for yoga instructors that provided the needed liability insurance, business and marketing tools, resources, as well as member benefits and industry discounts for yoga instructors and yoga therapists. Um, remember, we're doing these webinars the first and third Wednesday of every month, so please keep joining, keep sharing these events with your community. And again, if there's any topics that are of interest to you, interest to you please let us know. That's how we keep de defining what these sessions are like. It's all based on the feedback we get, so please keep that up. You know, we'll try to build these programs around the wants and needs of the yoga community. And now I'd like to introduce you to, to my buddy, Corey Sterling from Conscious Council. So Corey, you know, is a lawyer, a small business owner, a group fitness instructor, and yoga instructor. He wrote the Yoga Law Book, and he served hundreds of clients in the health and fitness space all across the world, the majority of whom own or operate a, a fitness and or health studio. So he's presented at conferences around the world, um, teaching about law in a fun and practical way. Corey won the award for the highest rated session at Mind Body Bold in 2019. That's a pretty prestigious award, and that's amongst a field of health and professional leading minds and the best and best presenters. In March of 2020, he completed the Mind Body Business Consulting Program in order to learn overall best business practices for studios, and is the only lawyer to hold that certificate. Um, and very quickly, I just want to touch on you know we'll, we will be answering questions as we go along. Um, we will try to save 10 to 15 minutes at the end for additional Q&A, so submit any questions that you have in the Q&A or the chat. Um, any questions, of course, that we can't answer today, we will do our best to get answered and send as a post-webinar communication. And now I'd like to hand things off to Corey. Joe, thanks, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Very, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful fit for, for us at Conscious Council to know that you know, we've got an awesome partner with Biogi and, and someone who we're aligned with and, um, you know, a business that cares about yoga professionals the same way that we do. So thank you for having us again. Thank you for this platform. For everyone who's listening, um, it's lovely to meet you. I wish that we could be hanging out in person, but I'm also still grateful that we have the chance to see each other through a screen from different parts of the world. Um, I want to emphasize the point of today's session is to make sure that you get valuable information, that you understand the ramifications of how the legal landscape for yoga professionals has changed in a very, very short period of time. There have been a lot of changes. And, you know, for me, I just want to make sure that everyone has access to a lawyer, has access to professionals who understand what is happening on the ground and how quickly things are changing. So please, the questions are welcome. Just so you know, I'm going to talk about those, those four different areas that Joe mentioned. We're going to talk about waivers. We're going to talk about uh, service agreements. We're going to talk about the employee contractor distinction, and we're going to talk ab about operating online. Um, it might see, I'm going to, I'm going to try to go as, you know, slowly and controlled as I can. I don't want any of this to feel overwhelming. The point of this is that we're having fun. You're learning about important information that's really going to be able to help you in your business. So don't worry about scribbling all the notes down or whatever it is, just if, if any part of it seeps into your mind, um, that's really, really good. And the, the whole point of this also is that we're at Conscious Council, we're sort of on a mission to make law fun, to make law accessible, and to change the paradigm of how 
yoga professionals operate with the law. So the first thing I can tell you is that it's actually, the law is really cool. Um, yeah, I said it, I went there. Um, law is cool because the law helps you protect and grow your business. And what, what, what I've seen in working with hundreds of yoga professionals and studios all over the world in the past four or five months is that there are new challenges that consistently come up um, in a lot of cases, revenues are not where they used to be. And a lot of business owners may be concerned or stressed or scrambling to figure out how to open again, how to operate safely, whatever it is that you're concerned about. But again, remember that the point of sharing all of this information is to get you excited about your business and excited about the potential of your business. And that all of it is, it's really the foundation for the next phase of, of where you're going. So that being said, um, we, ha we have prepared a checklist, which Jake is gonna put into the chat right now. So again, so the whole idea, um, I, don't, I don't want you to be stressed or nervous or whatever, taking too many notes. We've prepared a checklist for you with the basis for all the information of what I'm gonna speak about. Ask the questions when you got them. And otherwise, Joe, I think we're ready to roll. That's perfect, Corey. And I saw that Jake already posted that checklist. Thank you. That's perfect. What a great, what a great um, uh, uh, checklist to be able to, 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 to look through as, as we're going along here, Corey. Yeah, take it away, bud. Thank you. Cool. Okay, so we, we got everyone. I'm going to start in this whole picture of everything that's changed. I want to start speaking about the waiver of liability. A waiver of liability is a really important document. And the purpose of the waiver of liability is to have someone sign away their legal rights to bring an action against you if you are facilitating an activity for them. When I wrote the yoga law book, I did a lot of research into when and how waivers of liability will apply. And in addition to my private practice of operating as a yoga lawyer, there were many instances where I either defended a waiver of liability for a client or I was hired to challenge a waiver of liability. What I can say is this is the foundational document for your business because because of two main reasons. One is all of the other agreements we're going to discuss today, the extent of the, of the damages of liability, basically the extent to how vulnerable you will be as a result of the relationship usually is going to be known. So let's say you're a studio and you sell membership agreements or you're a studio owner and you have employees and something goes wrong in that particular relationship. At Conscious Counsel, we always say law is just a series of relationships. In those types of relationships, if something goes wrong, normally the extent to which you will be responsible to pay an amount of money will be to whatever was agreed. So let's say there's someone who signs an annual membership with you and um, something's happened and you you know, okay, in a worst case scenario, we can refund the annual membership. You know exactly the extent of what you're going to have to pay what it is. When it comes to a waiver of liability, it's different than all of the other documents because this is a document where um, you're not sure about the amount of possible damages that you might have to pay for someone because the circumstances are so unpredictable and something could go wrong. And as a result, someone may not be able to continue working the way they were working before. And as a result, the amount that you would owe or that your insurance company um, you know, would have to cover you for would be very, very, very high and, and you know, unforeseeable. Let's just use that word. So I want waivers to be really the first point that we, that we deal with because it is the foundation to protect you and your assets. A lot of people will say, oh, you know what, paying for, you know, paying, you know, $618 for a waiver of liability is really expensive and I don't want to do it and I'm just going to copy and I'm going to use it for my friends and whatever, this, that, or the other. From all of my research of waivers of liabilities, the, the distinguishing point between a great waiver of liability and a weak one is how specific the agreement is drafted towards the activities that you do and what the risks of those activities are. And I'm gonna speak about the technical elements of a waiver of liability in a second, but the reason why I'm sharing this point about how specific the waiver is, is because if a waiver of liability doesn't cover the specific activities that you're doing or the risks of those activities, it's exactly like not having a waiver of liability. So the importance of having this document is that it protects you, it protects all of your assets, and really it's, it's the most important posturing piece in the event that something goes wrong and you receive a demand letter from someone who got injured at your class or someone who contracted a communicable disease at your studio 
or whatever it is, someone who wants to start an action against you, your first line of defense is going to be a waiver of liability. The difference between having a great waiver of liability or a weak waiver of liability, when you have a great one, for me as a lawyer, if one of my clients says, hey, someone got injured and, you know, but they signed the waiver of liability, awesome. I'm on my computer, I'm drinking coffee, I'm having fun. Hey, you know, uh, I'll respond. I'm really sorry that you got injured at my client's studio. Attached is a screenshot of the waiver of liability that you signed. You know, you got injured while you were doing crow pose. Specifically, we mentioned that you may, doing, you may be doing arm balances while you're in the yoga class. You released us of any liability, therefore you're not able to bring a legal action. You know, my client's heart goes out to you and we want you to recover quickly, but you have forfeited your legal rights to bring an action. That's like scenario one when you've got a great agreement. Scenario two is, oh, yeah, I use my friend's waiver, but it doesn't cover the specific activities that we were doing. Um, and now, but now I've got this demand letter. For me as a lawyer in that position, I'm, I'm much more concerned because this, is going, this process is going to drag on. It's going to be longer because we're not in as strong of a position to succeed from the start. Everything is more difficult for us. So really, really, really want to stress the importance of a great waiver. Um, also, it, and, and sort of, I'm going to, Joe mentioned, you know, we're going to talk about practicing proactive law. At Conscious Counsel, what we call proactive law is being in control of the relationships that, that you have. That's what I want. I want all of my clients to be in control in case something happens. And the best way that you're in control is when you have awesome legal documents so that you're not letting someone else drive the wheel of a situation and then they're threatening you and they're sending you emails and you can't sleep. It's like, I want everything to be organized and in place from the start. Because it's a stressful time and everyone is putting more and more time and effort into their business than they ever had before. And generally speaking, earning less than they were before. It's never been more important to protect the investment of your time and all of the assets that you have. And that's like, that's where my heart goes out where it's like everyone is being stressed and, you know, working really, really hard to make it work and negotiating with landlords and, you know, going online and doing all these things that we weren't doing before for all of the effort that you're putting in, just have the appropriate legal documents in place. And that starts with the waiver of liability. So, the only like the elements of a waiver of liability and this is a great time to take a pen and paper out if you're listening are as follows remember it's all about how specifically the waiver of liability is drafted it doesn't need to be so specific as an example to mention something like crow pose but it should be specific enough that if someone is getting injured doing an activity with you you did tell them beforehand what they would be doing the situation of where a waiver would not apply is someone has gotten injured and that specific activity or the nature of that activity or the risk of that activity is not listed in the document that they signed and their rationale will be very simple and they will say, well, yeah, sure, I signed this waiver, but you never told me that we were going to be doing this together. You didn't tell me what the risks of this were going to be. And as a result, even though I signed away my rights, I only signed away my rights for what you told me about, not for things you didn't tell me about. And that's the essence of it. So the technical elements for a waiver of liability are describing the specific activities that are going to be done. So if let's say you're a yoga and you're a Pilates bar studio, you want to list all of the specific activities that you're doing. The second are what, what are the outcomes of those activities? What are the risks that are the potential outcomes of those activities? So with bar, you know, uh, muscle strains, maybe slipping and falling, having, you know, one leg on the bar and uh, then you fall on your body, you know, uh, a bodily injury, whatever it's going to be. Um, in addition to what, what the specific risks of the activities are, what the outcomes of those risks can be. So the outcome of the risk could be, you know, it could be disability, it could be permanent change of quality of living. And like, we, we never know, I think if, if anything from what our world has gone through in the past five months, we never know what's going to happen. And that's why it's better to use your own voice and you don't have to be scary and super intimidating, but let people know that it is possible that you could, you know, if you're practicing hot yoga, you could slip and fall. If you know, if you're doing a, a balancing pose or a one leg balance pose, you could slip and fall and, and seriously change the way that your body operates. And that could change the rest of your life. So 
it's the activities, it's the risks of those activities and the outcomes of those risks. Once you've told that to someone in the document, as specifically as possible, ideally, um, after that, you, this person has to affirm that they are healthy enough to participate in the activities. So you've told me everything that we're gonna be doing and what the risks are and the outcomes. I affirm that I'm healthy enough. When it comes to COVID related things, obviously we need to include, you know, uh, I've not been in contact with anyone or I've self quarantined or I'm not, I don't have any symptoms of what a communicable disease looks like. Um, and then after the affirmation of health, there has to be a voluntary uh, agreement to participate in the activities. And all of this is just like comes from a policy perspective of cool, the law takes someone signing away their legal rights really seriously. So you have to be upfront and totally honest with people about what they're doing. And once you've told them everything and we know they're healthy enough, then they can voluntarily choose to participate in the activities. And then lastly, once they voluntarily agree to participate, they can agree to sign away their legal rights to bring an action against you. So again, those elements that I want you to keep in mind are what are the activities? What are the risks of those activities? What are the outcomes of the risks? And then we have an affirmation of health, voluntary participation, and then lastly, signing away of the legal rights. Now, if this seems super overwhelming and challenging for you, it doesn't have to be. Um, at Conscious Can Council, we've distilled this process of working, um, you know, working with waivers and basically sending a link to our clients, which takes on average four and a half minutes to fill out, in which case you get a complete waiver of liability, which covers all the activities. What's happened since COVID, and now because COVID's here to stay, think about these elements that I mentioned. The activities are different because a lot of studios before only had documents related to operating in a studio, coming to our studio and practicing yoga there. Now everyone's doing everything online. In addition to things being done online and live streaming classes, we also have on-demand classes, which are different because the instructor's not able to, to observe the students and see what's happening. These are the, the slight variations that a waiver of liability needs to address that most waiver of liabilities that the yoga industry is currently using it, it doesn't have these pieces in addition to the distinction between online in studio on demand we also now have some studios that are just you know um impromptu taking classes outdoors do you is practicing yoga outdoors the same activity as practicing inside a studio no who knows there could be a piece of glass there there could be whatever create there could be a root of a tree or something whatever whatever it is it's like it's not my job to come up with all of the possible infinite things that could happen it's just about making sure that the document communicates properly for what these new added risks are um so with that i i think that that's pretty full for waivers of liability and I feel like I was just talking for a long period of time. Um, Joe, did you, was that helpful? I think that was very helpful. It did bring one question to mind um, that I think you, you could probably answer here. And um, you know, what I was thinking as you were, as you were laying out specifically like the outcomes of risk, you know, you started talking about some specific things that could happen to disability and injury. You know, how effective is, is some type of blanket language there as in, you know, maybe you list a couple and then you say, or any other possible injury, any other related injury, do, do those things hold up or is, is there blanket language like that? that works? It, it, it will. It's, it's a great question. And, and what I want you to keep in mind, everything at law, it's like, it's very rarely black and white. It's always going to be between discussed as between the parties or one, one, one party is going to make one argument. Another is going to make another argument. The issue that we want to avoid at all costs when it comes to waivers of liability has to do with how vague or how general the agreement is. So if it's something like you could be hurt, right? Ah, blah, 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 you're doing the activities and you could be hurt. If I was hired as a lawyer to challenge that waiver, I easily could, right? And even if, if the, one of the biggest questions we have with our clients always is, is whether or not to include death. Right, because you it, it's happened before as tragic and sad as it is. I was just knocking on wood. I don't know if you could hear that, but um, it is possible that someone has a heart attack while while practicing yoga. It's anything is possible. And and so some clients want to include death. Some clients don't want to include death. What I'll say to everyone is like the point of your legal agreements is should be the point of how you operate everything in your business. Follow your moral compass. 
and just find a way to communicate openly and honestly so that you're conveying an authentic message with your community, however you do so. But, and I hope that helps, but to directly answer, it would depend on specifically what is written and how it's written. But normally the rule of thumb is the more general it is, the more open it, it can be to being challenged by a lawyer or legal counsel. Gotcha. Thank you. No, that was that was very helpful, obviously. So it sounds like, you know, be specific as you possibly can, follow your moral compass, and then, um, you know, keep generalities is, is, I mean, I guess can be used, but not, but I would prefer to be specific. I didn't Yeah, really and, and it's, in, in some ways, you can't list, like, again, you don't have to list the, list the specific poses, but you do want to be specific enough. Remember, just reverse engineering. As a lawyer, I'm always thinking about the end situation, and the end situation is someone getting hurt and wanting to, you know, make a claim or allege that something did or did not happen, and how can we have the document support us as best as possible in that time. Um, if, if it's cool, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to employee and IC agreement. And if we have waiver, if we have questions about waivers, we can take them at the end. Perfect. Okay. So the, the waiver, uh, excuse me, the, in, the independent contractor employee question, even before COVID was a complex question, but it's changed slightly because as follows. One is like, as we know in California with the AB5, California passed legislation which stated if someone is carrying out the activities which are the core activities of the business, at law they are an employee, not a contractor. Doesn't matter how much time they're spent working, all of these things, that like totally changed the landscape even before COVID. But generally speaking, and, and I just wanna speak generally about the contractor employee distinction, what's changed is most studios had a model where it was a lot, a lot of contractors who would teach two, three, four times a week, two, three, four times a month, and probably zero employees or one, or one or two employees. Both for the IRS and the CRA, the question of a contractor employee always comes down to control. How much control does the, the boss have over the person who's doing the work? And, and the degree of control, the more control that the person who's paying or the employer has, the more control you have, the more the person who's working for you is an employee. And the whole idea is that a contractor is someone who operates their own business. So you wanna think of outsourcing part of your business to someone else to carry out part of it. And that's what a contractor does. The example that I always give is the wonderful woman who I work with, her name is Mallory. She's the graphic designer for Conscious Counsel. I've never met her. She works online. I don't think she's a robot, but like there are, she, there are mild robot tendencies for her. But Mallory's a contractor because we operate a law firm and the bulk of our business is drafting legal documents and Mallory will do the design for us. So she, she makes her own hours. She has her own schedule. She charges us based on the amount of work that comes in. It's not a, it's not a fixed fee or a flat rate. She does the work from, from wherever she wants. She pays her own subscriptions for Adobe Photoshop or whatever it is. Like Mallory runs her own business. I run my own business and I use part of her services with me. Where it gets challenging in the wellness industry, specifically in yoga, is that firstly, it's, it's cheaper to have contractors than it is to have employees. And as such, and also because as yoga professionals, we're not always doing things absolutely, totally properly as we should be. Um, because we're heart leading individuals and our focus is less on, you know, making sure you know, it's it, naturally, it's easier for us to lead a yin class than it is to create the distinction between a contractor and employee. And I myself is, am the same. I used to have a yoga festival and it was scrambled eggs and, until uh, it wasn't. But what, what I want everyone to recognize is a contractors operate their own business. And as such, they need to have the freedom to do that. The risks of misclassifying a contractor, uh, who someone who is an employee but calling them a contractor, is that you run the risk of a potential audit, and you also remember I said the point of all of the of, of operating at best legal practices is being in control. If you have someone who's working with you, and you know you've called them a contractor but you treat them as an employee, and there's some falling out, and maybe an issue around non-compete or non-solicitation or you don't want them doing their own classes on their Instagram live or whatever it is, 
because you don't have the right documents and you don't have the proper classification, you run the risk of that person filing a complaint against you, potentially reaching out to the, you know, the state or federal business bureau about the misclassification or writing you demand letter about how they deserve more um, that, that they are, that, that they're getting. So this is like the contractor employee distinction is a really, really big one. My personal, you know, philosophy is Governments have made laws to protect workers in particular circumstances, and obviously I respect those. So if you really are going to treat someone as an employee, just make them an employee. Yes, it is more expensive for you, but also see the upside of it in the sense that when you have someone who's an employee, you have more control over the services they're providing. You can tell them specifically what it is that you want them to do. Whereas with a contractor, you have much less control over what they do, how they do it, and any specifics around that. The reason why all of this has changed with COVID is that, again, we saw the traditional model of a studio having many contractors and very few, if no, employees. But after COVID, this eight, two things have changed. One is the specific way that we're asking our staff to work is much different because of all of the relevant health and safety protocols and how the way that we provide our services have changed. So it used to be, cool, you're a contractor, you know, let me know your availability, you can come to the classes, blah, blah, blah. But now, either as a response from what the community and our clients want or just simply how we operate, we have to be more specific with what, our ask, what we are asking our team to do. And remember, the more control you have over your staff, the more important it is, well, the more, the more indication it is that they are an employee and not a contractor. Um, additionally, another area and um, another area where, where we've seen things change post COVID is the, the lack of flexibility in the scheduling in the sense where our revenue numbers are generally down. And because our revenue numbers are down, we can't commit to the same, either the same pay that we used to pay our contractors or employees or the same volume, the same consistency of work being there. So what we've been doing a lot of has been changing either, you know, from contractors to employees, but putting provisions in where we don't guarantee a specific amount of income or a specific amount of remuneration. And even things where we say, hey, like, we're going to try to get you to teach six classes over the month of September, but, you know, we're only going to be able to give you 24 hours notice before those classes are, are going to take place. And you, the, the amount that you're getting paid is going to be changed from whatever, you know, 35, 40, 45 dollars to a percentage of how many people show up or whatever it is. And like, and the last thing that I want to say about employee contractor distinction, and just generally in, in working with your team during this time, I encourage all, everyone, both teachers and business owners, we all have to be more flexible, no pun intended, because we're speaking about yoga, but we have to be more flexible in the way that these relationships work, because in a lot of cases, it just isn't working for business owners any longer. And for a lot of teachers, it isn't working. It's not working for the, for the studio or business owner because the revenue model has changed. The way the services are provided has changed. And it's a completely different landscape. And for teachers, a lot of the times it's changed because they want to be building their own communities now and leverage their own social media to teach. And so, you know, what I always say is, Two parties can agree to anything that is not illegal. And when it, and in the biggest issue about, you know, contravening laws in the contract or employee distinction is A, have you misclassified? And B, are you making sure that you're paying people at a minimum, the minimum wage that, you know, state and federal laws indicate, which you always have to do. But other than that, we've encouraged clients to revisit their working arrangements and just like, you know, whatever, throw all the law out the window, have a real conversation and be like, look, this is how our business is currently performing. This is the way that our clients are currently, you know, um, consuming our content or behaving in our studio. Our relationship has changed and as such, we need a new agreement to reflect that. Does that help, Joe? Yeah, I think that was very helpful. You know, that's something, you know, you, it, it, in a lot of ways, I think a lot of people don't really think about, and that's just how the employee-employer relationship has changed post-COVID. You're right, we're, we're asking them to do different things. We're asking them to take further risks and, you know, also meaningful to, to you know, to our business operations. And there, there, were, there were so many, there are so many studio owners who we work with who would just come to us and they're like, this old relationship doesn't work. 
I'm, I need to change the way that I'm paying my teachers either for on-demand classes or for live streaming or teaching on Zoom. And like, it's, look, it's a judgment neutral thing. It's not a good thing and it's not a bad thing. It's just everything about how we operate our businesses have changed. And as such, we need to make sure that our agreements reflect that. That makes complete sense, absolutely. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep rolling and then we're going to leave questions for the end. I don't even, I'm going to check what time it is. Oh my gosh, we are in amazing shape. This is so absolutely perfect. Um, okay, so the, the next thing that I want to discuss um, has to do with service agreements. So a service agreement can be a lot of different things, but really what it is, normally in yoga, it's going to be either a teaching agreement for you and your students if you teach privately. Um, it's going to be a membership agreement if you have a studio and you have members of your agreement, uh, if you have members of your studio, or it's going to be like, if you have a retreat, if you operate a retreat, for example, you'd have a retreat agreement. Now, at Conscious Council, we just call these service agreements because what it is, is someone, um, someone you providing a service to someone and what are the rules around that relationship? As I mentioned before, the way I want everyone to think about the law is a series of relationships. And the goal in each of those relationships is how can we communicate openly and honestly? Now, service, agreement, service agreements have changed because the way that we provide our services have changed. And, and with a lot of studio owners, we've seen a total overhaul of the way that they operate their, um, their services and the way that they interact and work with their clients. So two examples that I just want to raise about how service agreements have changed. Um, and, and these are indications, again, remember, the reason why we're revisiting our legal agreements now is because our, the relationships that we have have changed. So we want the agreement to be up to date with the type of relationship that we want to have with our community. I believe that communicating openly and honestly is like a great means of respect. And that's where the best relationships come from. And that's why I share all of these things. So with service agreements, I just want to share two really quick points. Um, but again, for everyone who's listening, just keep in mind, okay, you know, I used to work with my clients like this. Now I'm working like this. How can I have an agreement that communicates that? The, the biggest issue that we saw in COVID had to do with consumer protection laws. So consumer protection laws exist in all jurisdictions and they're basically rules that the government says, okay, there's some power discrepancy between someone who's buying something and someone who's selling something. And as such, inherently, we are just going to imply all of these rules, which will protect consumers from things that they buy, from fraudulent purchases, from this, that, or the other. In, during this COVID period, one of the biggest consumer protection issues that came up had to do with someone having purchased a studio membership or a retreat or this or that or a teacher training or whatever it is but the, the studio or the teacher trainer or the retreat facilitator being unable to provide those specific services. So in the retreat, excuse me, in the service agreement, one of the biggest changes that we've made is defining the scope of services to be different. And the way that we, des we describe the scope of services now in, on September 2nd, 2020, is that it's either going to be provided online, in, in person, in a specific location, and it can be in any three of these things. So let's say even if we look at something like a festival, someone purchases a ticket to a yoga festival. And upon purchasing the ticket, we say, hey, you know, we're expecting to have it, have this take place in Caraiva Park on September 28th. And, you know, it's going to be great. And there's going to be food vendors and whatever. We have to follow the rules, but this, that, or the other. Um, but in the event that you know the government cancels or that we're, the municipal rules or laws state that we are unable to do this, the event will also be taking place online. And in the event we're only able to offer this particular service online, we will still be deemed to have provided the services. And like classic example of how you can write two sentences into an agreement that totally changes your exposure to risk or liability or having to offer refunds if you don't mention that. Because if you're selling someone a ticket, and I don't wanna really speak about events, we just say, if you're selling someone a membership or you know someone's whatever, gonna be coming to this festival, and you say, ah, it's a festival, it's at this date, at this time, in this specific place, and you're unable to provide that good, 
that you are selling at law consumer protection laws, which you cannot contract out of, you cannot contract out of consumer protection laws. At law, they are automatically entitled to a refund, even if they say no refunds, because government says, well, someone's not allowed to sell something to someone and then not give it to them or not have it available to be given. So the whole idea of changing the service agreements to include um, provisions around being offered online and in person is like, you're totally covered from all of the issues that any, you know, someone wants to cancel their membership or, you know, I, I paid for a 10 pack, but I want it back because the studio had to shut down again, whatever it is, like, I, I, I want your services to be as broad as possible and also make it as easy as possible for you to provide your services. Um, the second reason why service agreements have changed is that we need to, we need concrete support or evidence that we have explained to people exactly how working with our studio or working with us in yoga has changed. One example of that could be, and we got this a lot from studios when they were reopening, they were only allowed to have, you know, five or six different spots, but we would have, um, we would have some students that would come to two classes a day or, you know, come every single day. And, but you, there had to be some sort of parity or fairness for the entire community. So studios needed to come up with rules about, okay, you're, this is, you know, you have an unlimited membership, but in practicality, this is what that means and what it equates to. And just like organizing all those things that you probably didn't think might be issues, but ended up being issues. But in addition to that, the following of safety protocols, basically short and sweet and making sure that you have your members sign an agreement that says, I understand that these are the rules and these are the hygienic issues that I must follow. And you know, I will wash my mat or I will wear a mask or I will do this or I won't do that. And if I don't do that, I understand that the studio is allowed to ask me to leave and not provide a refund. Um, as, as a lawyer, anytime a client of mine is an issue, it has an issue, it always comes down to storytelling. So I always want my clients to be in the best possible position where if a claim is made against them or they, you know, they have a student who's coming to the studio who's not following the rules and they have to ask that person to leave. I always want to be able to tell the best story that I possibly can. And the, the text for that story is going to be the agreements that we had our clients sign. So the importance of having a, a solid studio agreement, you know, we're refiguring out how payments work, what membership looks like, when payments are made, how the services are offered, all of those other things I mentioned. But in addition to that, we're holding our community accountable to ensure the safety of everyone else, which to me, it, it's sort of, it's just logical. And in the event that you need to enforce that and ask someone not to return or, you know, exclude someone from the community because they're putting others at risk, that it's really, really easy for you to do that. And it doesn't become a whole issue that, you know, drains your energy and takes your focus away from providing a great experience to your clients. Um, cool. And so, so Joe, I'm just, I'm just going to keep going because I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions if there are any. Um, perfect, and perfect. so the last thing that I just want to speak about is operating online. And for that, I'm, I'm just speaking about a privacy policy, the terms of service for your website, as well as an online disclaimer. Um, these these sort of documents are the function of them are different because it used to be the relationship remember law is always a series of relationships so the relationships that we used to have were you know okay let's say i'm in caraiva brazil and i have a studio here um i i know more or less who's coming to my studio maybe there will be a tourist here or there but i have my members i know my community because of ev everyone taking their classes online the amount of people consuming our content is much larger than it was before. And it's also like happening with different people than we ever had before. So a lot of the times client would say to me, oh, you know, they're my community and I don't need to, I don't need to put this information there. I don't need to fix this. But what I'm seeing now is clients are having issues with people who they don't really know who are accessing their, their content, whether that, that has to do something with either copyright or, you know, someone copying something. So I just want to go over the basics of privacy term, you know, terms of service and the online disclaimer. Privacy policy, super straightforward. And this only has to do really with um, compliance. So basically government says, government across the board says, if you're collecting anyone's personal information, you have to let them know exactly what you're doing with that information. 
let's say you have a website and you use Stripe to collect your payments or you use MindBody or you use Wellness Living, whatever it is that you use, you should have a privacy policy, even though you're not the one that's technically collecting it, you have at law, you have to let people know, you know, who is going to be processing the payment and, and put a link to their privacy policy. It's just rules. It's just following the rules and making sure you have everything in a privacy policy that you're following and that any information collected, first name, last name, email, credit card, whatever it is, that transparency, people have an opportunity to know what you're doing with their information and how you're using it. Terms of service are sort of like the rules for someone interacting with your website. Um, unless you have these rules written down, it can be very, very difficult to enforce them. An example of this is sort of what I mentioned about either you know a refund policy or cancellation um, or copyright or trademark issues, anything related to that. When you have a terms of service, it's something that we draft up. Um, again, it takes four and a half minutes to answer a bunch of questions. And then in the event that you need to enforce your rights and you have an issue around someone complaining, someone copying something, whatever it is, remember you just, all you have to do is take a screenshot of what your terms of service are. They're posted on your website at law. Those are implied to, to apply to anyone who's on your website, purchasing your services, using your content, all government allow the rules allow you to have to set the rules in the terms of service. And then lastly, online disclaimers, really, really important because we have a lot of people who are practicing on Zoom and on Instagram Live and on Facebook Live. Um, and, and because it's so difficult to, ha if when you don't know who's tuning in, you can't get everyone to sign a waiver of liability. So the point of, of linking a disclaimer to your website is that on your website, you can you know state what your qualifications are and where you know where you got your yoga certification and if it's related to yoga alliance or whatnot um you always want to have information you know uh, i don't diagnose diseases i don't provide medication uh, no guarantee for results all of the stuff that we put in disclaimers but the point of that is you want to protect yourself in the event that someone is doing a class with you or they see you know an instagram video where you're talking about touching your toes or perfect back bends or whatever and Right at law, there's something called the duty of care, which means when you are facilitating an activity for someone, you have a responsibility to make sure that they're going to be safe in you facilitating that activity. And because on Instagram Live or however it is that you may be broadcasting what you're doing, you don't have the chance to get everyone to sign a waiver of liability. So you want to make sure that you have a form of protection. An online disclaimer is not the best, it's not the gold standard. But for me as a lawyer, it's certainly helpful to have that than to have nothing. And, and again, the whole idea with everything I'm talking about for all these different relationships, communicating openly and honestly um, and letting people know what they can expect from interacting with your services. You always wanna be able to tell a story with the legal documents that you have. And the story that I want everyone telling is that we are not negligent, we were responsible, we had the foresight to communicate all of this before anyone participated in activities with us. And as such, in the event that something unfortunate happens, I can resolve all of it in an email instead of having to hire a lawyer, be stressed, have all of my attention diverted from serving my clients in my community. Instead, like screenshot, boom, this is what our online disclaimer says. We're really sorry, we love you. We hope you're gonna be better. That's it, Joe, that's what I got, man. Um, well Corey, first off, thank you very much. I think that's all, you know, every time you come on, I, I always find we're, we're, we're getting into more of the very, very relevant information for our time. And, you know, just can't thank you enough for providing some guidance on some of these really kind of scary times to a lot of people. You know, when you were talking about the, um, the service agreements, particularly, you know, I feel that everybody on this, uh, you know, watching this or, you know, most people even in the world probably were affected by something like that one way or another, whether you were on the business owner side where you had a service that wasn't able to provide that service because COVID happened, or you're on the consumer side, you know, maybe you had tickets for a concert and, you know, we saw how a lot of that went down where those concerts either got refunded or they got, or they weren't refunded and they were pushed to, to next year. So having that ironclad service agreement that suggests if this doesn't happen, you know, we will run this virtual event. I mean, that's just something I wouldn't have thought of and it just makes so much sense. So again, just appreciate you touching on points that I think a lot of people aren't thinking about. It's, it, it's, a, it's a pleasure to do so. And obviously I hope you can sense my enthusiasm and passion for this fun. Um, but Joe, where it comes from is we just learning 
from learning through all of these through our clients. Like a lot, you know, learning, 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 clients going through issues, issues, issues. And the cool thing about this industry is the variance of how people operate and the services they provide are not that different. So all of this information should apply to all yoga professionals. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Well, it does look like a few questions came in. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to kind of go from the top to bottom here and see how many of these we can knock out. I don't know if there's a, if there's a lot. We can probably get through all of these. Um, all right. So this was from Amelia. Says she wrote, Amelia Bernard at 122 wrote, so do clients need to sign a waiver for online classes, either live or recorded on my website? I have a disclaimer, but is that enough? I know we kind of touched on it, but if you'd like to just give Yes, it. you want the waiver of life, a signed waiver of liability. Remember, so, and I'll just, um, I'll just sort of like piggyback this to another question that I often get is there are yoga teachers who offer donation classes and they'll always say, oh, well, it's donation. Do I still need people to sign a waiver. So if it's online, if it's on demand, if it's live stream, whatever it is, just remember duty of care. If you are facilitating an experience for someone, an activity for someone, you have to make sure that they are going to be safe in, in, in you facilitating that activity for them. And if you fall below that duty of care, whether it's online, whatever it is, whatever context, yes, they should always be signing a waiver of liability. Because remember sort of what I spoke about, the issue is that the, the, the potential of damages or risks or you know, out, the potential damages can, can really be a lot and completely unpredictable and that can really shake the business more than anything else. So yes, if you are facilitating an activity for someone, you should have them sign a waiver of liability. Perfect, thank you. And then Margarita Tree wrote, and this is for a, this is a B Yogi question. And Corey, maybe you can back me up on my answer here. Um, does B Yogi offer an online disclaimer template or verbiage? And um, a couple of pieces. I know uh, it, Lizzie over in the chat box had posted it where we had uh, put some templated documents that we have designed based on this wonderful dialogue we've gotten from Corey. But I do want to throw an additional disclaimer out there that, um, you know, per our dialogue with Corey, the guidance we've gotten from him that is, is best of a template we can provide for whether it's a disclaimer, a waiver, it's, it's very important, and Corey can back me up on this or, or, or tell me if I'm wrong, that, you, that you, you have it customized to your business and, you know, we highly recommend talking with the council to make certain that it's, that it's ironclad. Um, does, that, does that sound right? Yeah, Corey? I, I, I would 100% make sure that if anyone is, is using these agreements, do not, please, please, in my book, The Yoga Law Book, I wrote a whole chapter called Why You Shouldn't Copy Agreement, you know, copy agreements from the, way, from the internet or download agreements or use someone else's. I can, I can tell you if it seems like a really quick, easy, simple solution to use someone else's agreement or to copy something else, but the, uh, there is a lawyer out there who will challenge it and who will sniff it out and you will, it's like not having it. So it's, it's really, really, it's really, really important to have these, the documents customized specifically to your business. Yes, absolutely. So that's, um, that makes a lot of sense. Let me go over to the chat and see what questions came here. Um, this is again from Margarita. Can you, in, uh, how can you include all the risks and outcomes? That list could be endless. And uh, Margarita, I think, you know, I, I think we touched on that. And of course, you know, that's, you know, that's a particular challenge. And, you know, again, going back to, um, you know, be as, as, as absolute specific as you can be. But, um, you know, she's right there. It's, you know, if you, you know, the, the outcomes are limitless. What, what do you do? It's, it, it, okay, the outcomes are limitless. Nice reference to a Bradley Cooper film for all those Bradley Cooper film buffs out there. Um, y there, are, there are a ton. At, at Conscious Council, we have the document to two pages that includes all of the activities and risk. Remember, you just think, don't get overwhelmed and don't, don't focus in on what the potential problem could be. Reverse engineer it. Put yourself in the situation of, okay, what activities do I do? What is most likely, what are the most likely out, you know, outcomes and risks of those activities? And include that. The situation you want to avoid, remember, the situation you want to avoid is something that you did not, an activity you didn't describe, or a risk that you completely missed, you totally missed the boat on it takes place and that person can then say, well, even though I did sign away my legal rights, I only did for these activities and these risks. It doesn't have to be like, oh, breaking a nail and cracking a knuckle and this, that, or the other. It doesn't have to be that specific, but just think about an objective third party 
So like a judge or a mediator or someone who didn't know anything about the situation, they are going to review the documents to see what is included. Would, would, if you pulled a random person off the street and asked them, hey, this person signed this document and this is what happened, you know, should it apply? Do you think that it's fair? And, and the other thing I'd say is part of us at, at Conscious Council offering legal packages to clients is that we understand that yoga teachers are yoga teachers and they're not lawyers. And, and that's why there's a professional service that we offer for all of this. That's great. Thank you, Corey. A couple of these questions did get answered in the chat, but just for the benefit of the community, I'll, I'll provide some public answers here. Um, does BOG provide sample waivers that can be admitted and adapted? Similar to the other question, and the answer is yes, and you can look in that chat box. And uh, if you look in the chat section, there is a link to those. Again, going back to anything, anything pulled offline, anything that's templated, absolutely needs to be firmed up um, and, and, and uh, I recommend it to be run by counsel. Uh, and, ja and I know this one was also answered. Jacqueline wrote, I'm a health and wellness coach and a yoga teacher. My work is now 99% virtual um, with occasion in-person sessions. Does the yoga provide insurance coverage that would cover me? The answer is yes. Our program covers not only live face-to-face -face sessions, it covers live online. Um, we now include coverage for pre-recorded videos, which was um, one of the things that we were able to add to our program as a response to the pandemic, which has been very helpful to our community. Um, and again, there's some, some um, links there provided by Lizzie. Thank you, Lizzie, for providing those. Um, Jacqueline also wrote, as an individual teacher, when I offer public community classes via Facebook or via Zoom, how do I capture waivers from folks when I don't know who's going to be showing up? That's the, that's the, the important, if you don't know, ideally you have some form of email capture beforehand. So you get the emails of the participants before your class, and then you can email them a copy of the waiver and have them electronically signed beforehand. In the event that that's completely impossible and it's totally out of your control, you're gonna, you, I would speak to the community, uh, I think community center, I didn't get to read the question, but if there's a community center, I would speak with them to try to get the information from them first and foremost, and then send it out there. If you're totally unable to know who is witnessing or participating in your classes, that's where you need a, a very strong online disclaimer. Yeah. But remember the waiver is the gold standard. You know, it makes me wonder, and I'm certain that there's is a response to the pandemic, or maybe even there was something that, that existed before that. I'm sure that there's streaming services that allow some type of entry based on you have to sign the waiver to or sign the waiver disclaimer to gain entry, and it seems like that would be an important piece of technology available. Yeah, there's. I think we we recommend Waiver King, um, but when for all of our clients, we include a document that's called How to Use Our Documents Electronically. But there are a variety of services where it's really easy. You know, it's sort of like a portal. It used to be the front desk at the yoga studio is where people would um, people would check in and sign the waiver before you let them into the class. And it's sort of like a virtual desk. Um, you know, I, I really like that question because that gives me a, a to do. Uh, you know, perhaps I you know I'll look into finding um, a solution for that or a software or maybe a member benefit that we could could find a you know just a resource where somebody could have that type of. Um, uh, I almost come, call it like a lock. You unlock the lock by signing the waiver um, to add to your streaming platform. I'll see what I can do to find to help our community with that. Um, uh, so uh, this is from Camille. Should, should those disclaimers be displayed or verbally spoken every time you start a live video? You do, you do a verbal, so remember, we use our documents for storytelling purposes. And when it comes to something that was said, firstly, verbally, it would be very difficult for you to be able to, you know, knock all of the technical elements that I spoke about in a waiver if you're just sharing them. But also, um, when it when it comes to um, when it comes to something happening and then you needing to rely on the best evidence or the best support for you in telling your story, when it's finger pointing or she said versus she said, it's very as a lawyer, it's very very difficult. And I can tell you, the settlement will reflect that. Like if an issue comes up. And we're trying to, I've never, ever, ever tried to apply a verbal waiver, but if I was, the other lawyer would say like, no, that's not really going to fly. We, you know, you don't have evidence or support for this. And as such, what that does is it, it weakens the position that I have um, for my client. And I always want my clients to be in the best position. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I know we're, we're getting close on time. I, you know, I'm looking at some of these questions. They seem very relevant and very engaged questions. So I, I hope you have a, a couple of extra minutes. I'd like to get through these. I, I'm, I, I, unfortunately, I, I've got another meeting that starts in two minutes. But Joe, what we can do is um, if there's some sort of follow up, maybe Lizzie can help. Everyone can submit questions and then I can record a video in answering them.
I'm happy. I, I, as I said, the first thing I said is I want to make sure everyone gets access to having these questions answered. So be Yogi community. Um, please know I'm here. If you want, you can put those questions in the chat box and then I'll record a video in the next day or two and we'll send them out. Um, the last thing that I just want to share on our behalf is based on this call, um, we've created a legal package for anyone who's interested. Uh, as of last week, we were not taking on new clients, but we have three spots for this package available. It includes the service agreement, either an employee or contractor agreement and a waiver of liability. The whole idea is like, hopefully you learn something from, from all of this and, and maybe it's a little bit complicated for you to, oh, how do, where do I start? How do I draft it? Again, the average response time is to fill up the documents is four and a half minutes. So you're looking at about 14 minutes of your life um, and then we'll, we'll get all the documents that we use with all of our clients. And, um, and yeah, I think Jake, maybe you'll post a link to where that is. And unfortunately we only have three spots, but, um, we're happy to help everyone. And, and Joe, thank you for having me like love, love your community, love helping out. Let me know if you know, I'll answer those questions and that's it for me. Perfect. Well, we'll definitely get those answers out to everybody at ASAP and again, Corey, thank you so much. You know, as you know, really, really appreciate you providing your expertise here. As this information continues to evolve, you know, the information is different now than it was a month ago. I'm hoping we get an opportunity to do this again as this landscape continues to continues to change and really just appreciate how much value you bring to our community. And thanks, Corey. Cool. With love. Better yoga for everyone. <laughs>